Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 2 with me, Eric Erhard, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll be getting started with Worksheet 23 for Chapter 14 on Clustering. So we'll come down to the Clustering assignment, and we're going to look at this HTML right here. So this is really cool data on uh, the Razorback Sucker Fish collected from the San Juan River up at the Four Corners. Um, about half of the river is in New Mexico. And it was collected by and analyzed by the wife of a former student. And uh, they were both very gracious to share the data with us for a, you know, a, a, real anal a real data analysis for us. So in 2014, uh, razorback suckers were collected and isotopes were, uh, or um, samples of, of the fish were, were collected and a stable isotope analysis was performed. Um, isotopes are versions of elements. For example, um, carbon has, has a few isotopes. Carbon-12 is the common um, type of, uh, you know what, this is not a great, <laughs> this is not a great web page, but the point is that there's there's many types of each element. Uh, carbon 12, you know, right, carbon is defined by having 12 protons, and then it can have a, a different numbers of neutrons. Carbon 12 has six protons and six neutrons, you add that up, has atomic weight of 12. If it has seven neutrons, then it's carbon 13, and that is also stable. Carbon-14, that has eight neutrons, is unstable and will eventually decay into nitrogen. And I think it releases, releases a beta particle or something. And when it does that, then you can use that unstable isotope for carbon dating and know how, how old things are. Anyway, so there's different isotopes. We're going to be looking at these elements, barium, calcium, magnesium, and strontium and a set of stable isotopes for each one to try to uh, understand how fish from different sources, so we've got five sources, we're not going to be looking at the unknowns in this class or this assignment, just two from hatcheries. Uh, Dex and GJH are from hatcheries. And then there's two wild sources, NAP is a pond, and SJR is the San Juan River. And our goal is to use um, observations from these four groups and various clustering methods and indices to determine how many clusters or how many groups do these uh, fish combine into. Um, and these would be sort of natural groups based on the data. This is another word for clustering is unsupervised classification because we're not using any of the information about where they actually come from to try to make the groups. We're just relying on the data values. All right, so first we're gonna do uh, clustering and do our best job, and then we're gonna see whether the clustering actually reveals um, useful groups. Sometimes groups are, are highly overlapping and clustering can't separate them. Uh, but sometimes groups are very different and clustering does a great job separating the groups. All right, so we've downloaded the data. We'll start by um, uh, removing observations with missing values. We go from 1512 down to 1447 observations. We are keeping the isotope range of, of rows that we care about, as well as each source. So we've, here we have nine isotope ratios and sources. Oh, let's see. There's a solution here. Add code above. Oh, we can see. There's a few unusual observations. Uh, go ahead and, and remove those in this box here. Okay, and I guess you can, you could probably just, 
do it up here too, but it's, it's cleaner to do it in this solution box. We're going to see those unusual observations right away. So here's a scatter plot. This scatter plot can takes to can take a while to generate, and so I recommend once you have done some of the data cleaning and doing filtering or transformations, those decisions, go ahead and comment out uh, this code or disable it in some way so that it's not producing this plot every time you knit the data. All right, so what do we see right away? There's a few, well, actually, let me see what the questions are. Describe the relationships between the isotopes of the same element, okay, the same atomic number. I've actually uh, selected only one isotope for each of these as a starting point. What I recommend is put a pound sign in front of this code right here to unselect these. That way you get all of the observations. Now, that's going to take a real long time <laughs> to plot. But the point is you can see that, you know, for example, the two barium, I think, are there two bariums? Yeah. The two barium columns are going to be highly correlated, and the magnesium columns are going to be correlated, and the SR columns are very highly correlated. They're so correlated, in fact, looking at just one of these, these isotopes for each element should be sufficient to really understand what's happening. But... Convince yourself. Put a put a pound sign in front of in front of the pipe symbol, and and take a look at all of them at least once to to convince yourself that looking at one isotope is sufficient. So describe those relationships that you see, and then source populations may or may not be different. Uh, describe the source differences that you see. So there's a few things that we can see right away. Um, for calcium, this middle column, um, and also the middle row, we see these two observations way out here on the left-hand side. And there's a couple little little outliers here, too, in a way. They, the rest of them all clump. So consider some threshold here to get rid of at least these two strange ones. Um, what else do we have? Uh, there might be some, some real heavy skewness in some of these isotopes, so can maybe consider a transformation of some type. Here's one of the things I really want to point out about isotopes, or about, you know, when you take different measurement, when you measure different things, uh, different types of measurements can separate populations in different ways. If you look at magnesium right here, all of these four box plots are sort of about lined up. You can't really separate the groups based on magnesium. But look at strontium. These three all line up, and dex is entirely different. Almost no overlap at all with, with the observations. In fact, you could probably draw a vertical line and partition them perfectly. Strontium is a, is a huge, um, hugely powerful discriminator between these populations. Look also at barium. These two populations... Um, I think those are the wild populations, are, are really scrunched together and, um, and entirely different from the two uh, wild populations. So, so, you know, look at the clouds of points in, in this plot and um, just sort of to get a feel of how, how these different isotopes um, can separate the groups. All right, clustering. Zoom back in. All right, you're going to spend most of your time on this part of the problem. I've set up some um, code below. I'll show you in a second. But your goal is to find a clustering method that creates a dendrogram that seems to have a relatively small number of clusters. And given that we have almost 1,500 observations, I'd consider a small number to be somewhere between two and eight clusters. And that that there are differences between the clusters, right? In our dendrogram, we're looking for long branches, right? So the dendrogram here, we're looking for these long branches that, that distinguish the groups. And we want similarity within, within clusters. So within a cluster, you want to have short branches. So that points within a cluster are very similar 
but they're very different between points between clusters. All right, um, good. Let's take a look at what's happening here. So the first thing I do, all these clustering methods require a numeric matrix. So I start off with the data, I remove the source column so that we only have the isotope columns. I turn that into a matrix, right? It started off as a data frame. Now it's a matrix and now it's a numeric matrix and I'm putting that into dat um, underscore num for numeric. Then here's some place here's a place to make some edits. I sort of have some duplication here. You probably just delete this first one. But the point is that I've got a numeric switch to help you select which clustering method you want to use. So the clustering method is going to be, in this case, my clustering method number is four. So that means it's one, two, three, four is the complete clustering method. And so that index goes here and it selects the fourth item from that list and puts that into clustering method. And that's going to be used in this piece of code down here for the clustering method. The second is an index to, to this, right, these clustering inde indices help us select how many clusters do the data suggest that there are, right? Here I've listed 30 possible <laughs> clustering indices. Um, I recommend not running all of these. Some of these take a very long time. Uh, some of them don't actually produce very good estimates of numbers of clusters. I would stick to the ones that we discussed in class or in my lecture notes, whatever you call, is we use the cubic clustering criterion, the pseudo t squared. Mm, did we talk about one of these trace ones? I forget. Rubin is probably pretty good. Uh, the callback Leibler KL is probably pretty good. But I would select a, a set of these, and you can select multiple um, indices at the same time. If, in fact, if you wanted to just do all of them, you could put one colon thirty, and that would give you all the all the integers from one to thirty, and that would run all of them. You may actually get an error on some of these, um, but just give it. You know, I wouldn't necessarily give that a try. I would look. I would look at maybe the. A se several of these and you can do them together and this clustering index gets put down here and the NB clust function runs and ultimately so what I've just selected is 4 which is complete clustering using 4 the cubic clustering criterion that results in an estimate of 3 clusters alright so Let's assume that we've got three clusters. So, I don't know, this is sort of dumb, but basically I'm putting three into this I plus um, variable. I'm doing that by selecting, right, in this nc out best.nc, that's the number of clusters. The first element there is three. And so I've selected the first element, which gives us three clusters. All right, so I print that out. I class, we've got three clusters. Great. So now we're going to create the plots. Uh, I create a distance matrix and do the complete clustering on that distance matrix. And I've cut the tree based on the number of clusters, three, that I wanted. And I plot that information. And I put a title in there. And I label the groups, or I label each observation, I believe, and then I draw rectangular boxes. And that produces this plot. All these labels are too small to read because there's 1,450 something of them. But if you have a large monitor, help yourself and make that really wide. Uh, you can sort of see patterns, right? All of these points right here seem to be have the same label. But the main thing that you're looking for is, are these clusters very different from each other? And that's the long branches that separate the clusters, and are the branches sort of short within. This, The top of this red box is basically the point where we're drawing our horizontal cut line to cut this dendrogram into three 
parts, right? If you prune this tree by snipping here, snipping here, and snipping here, you've produced the, the clusters that are in the red boxes. If you were to move this red line down further and cut here, then you would cut these two branches instead of the one above, and you'd have four clusters. And that's, that's what those clustering indices are helping you choose, is at what height are you going to cut the tree. All right, so given those um, cuts, here is another way of, 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 of looking at the data. This, this cluster plot, um, I'm looking here at the first two principal components of those nine isotope values and the clusters that we chose. So cluster number one is this big magenta circle, which is basically all the black circles. Cluster two is the red triangles. Cluster three is the green plus signs. And you can have overlap here in these first two components because these groups may separate in a third or fourth or fifth dimension. Okay, so I wouldn't, don't worry that they're overlapping in these components. This is just one way of visualizing uh, how the, what the data look like. But look at cluster two, man, it is distinct from, from the other two for sure. Cluster one, you see sort of two groups here. You wonder whether maybe there's a way of separating those two. So maybe three clusters isn't quite right. I'd maybe look at a different clustering method or a different clustering index. Okay, that's where you sort of iterate, do do it again and again and again, and and see see if you can get some clusters that really make sense. And ultimately discuss the method you're going to choose and why. Did you like complete clustering? Did you like single? Did you like average linkage? Okay, and finally, did the index did an index help you decide the number of clusters? Okay. You, your human visual inspection of looking at, say, this dendrogram and saying, looks like I should cut it at three, or it looks like I should cut it at four, or maybe I should cut it down at seven or something, or even up here at two at the very top, right? You're also, you're also I would qualify you just as a human pattern recognition machine that you can, you can also determine just based on the dendrogram how many clusters seem reasonable. So let, let you know, discuss here whether that index actually helped you. All right, once all that's done and you're happy with the clusters, meaning you like where you, you like where you cut this, and when you look at this plot, it looks like, it looks like groups of points that belong together were grouped together. Once you're happy with that visually, Right, all of this is qualitative, right? It's all about sort of feeling good about it. There, there aren't hard metrics about, about the truth of clusters. Um, it's, it's a helpful method, but um, not a definitive method. So once you're, right, so stop. Don't do this next part until you're happy with the clustering. Once you're satisfied, then. And I have an eval equals false in the code chunk you just delete that eval equals false and you'll start getting two plots here. And when you do, uh, let's see, well, I want to show you, but I don't want to give anything away. How do I do that? What you'll see are at, under these plots is you'll see two sets of plots. One, they're, they're faceted in different ways. They're basically the same plots, um, colored in one way, and then faceted by the other, okay? The first one is faceted by source. So you'll get a little scatter plot of Ba versus Sr, so barium versus strontium. So barium versus strontium, let's go up and, and look at that. Barium, is that it? Yeah. So here's barium versus strontium, this plot right here. So you'll have a plot that looks similar to this, unless you transform some variables. And for each of the sources, so DEX, GJH, NAP, and SJR, you'll have a different facet. And you'll see whether, and you'll have a different, each one will have a different color based on the cluster that it, that it was put into. 
Um, oh gosh. It's, oh gosh. I want to just show you. Oops. Did that work? Okay. So here's an example. So DEX, right? So the four sources. In this case, we're just looking at an example that has four um, clusters. And the colors, they're colored by cluster. And up here, you see all the green except for one red. Um, so of, in the DEX sources, one of those were, was in a, right, they're all in one cluster except for another one, which is in a second cluster. This group, they were all in a cluster all by themselves. So almost no confusion there. For NAP, there's sort of a lot of three and four, uh, clusters three and four are sort of uh, confused because they lay on top of each other so much. Another way of looking at that is the other way. So this, in this case, we are looking at the clusters, cluster one, two, three, and four, and determining which sources ended up in each cluster. In the first cluster, it's mostly the green one, GJH, with a couple from other sources. In the second cluster, they're all DEX, so it's sort of perfect there. In cluster three, there's a mix of the of NAP and SJR. Same thing for cluster four. So that's that's sort of what I'm hoping that you'll be uh, looking at. Yours may look different from that. That was just sort of a, an example. Okay, I'm paging down. So describe how the clustering performed, right? How reliable does the clustering seem? If you run this, if you ran this using different clustering methods, different numbers of clusters, um, does it seem consistent with, um, you know, yeah, reliable? Does it seem consistent? Do you get reliable answers? Also reliable, you might think of, you know, can you trust a cluster to tell you which source um, a fish came from? Or are they all sort of mixed up? Or does it separate some sources but not other sources? That's what I'm looking for there. All right, finally, uh, cluster differences uh, using different methods. Um, so given your experience trying different methods to develop the clusters, and right, think about how you looked at each of those dendrograms to evaluate how well they were doing. And the different results of indices, right? Some indices might give th three clusters, while others give five or six, or some might give like 13. Uh, make a few comments about how robust you think it is, right? So how, how dependable is, is the clustering? Um, that is, if clustering results are very sensitive to the options you select, then it's not very robust, right? You, it, maybe this isn't a method you can always count on. Okay, so make some comments there. That's everything for this assignment. I um, hope you enjoy it. And thanks again to uh, Adam for providing this data to us.